Look, you, you, you understand here. Um. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it's more, it's better to be slanted and be able to see it. Yeah, I need to be able to change it. Yeah, I just have to take off the, the cover. Mm -hmm, that's all. Mm -hmm. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the main meeting of the Barbados Genealogy Group. We have some new faces, so I'll just introduce myself. My name is Harriet Pierce, and I'm the coordinator, facilitator, well, jack of all trades of the genealogy group. And today, before we get into the main item on the program, we just have a, a little business. So first, I want to remind you of a few things. We have a bus tour coming up. We have a bus tour coming up on the 15th of June. Uh, if you are interested, please indicate. It's actually a bus tour of Northern St. Michael and St. James. And it's a genealogy bus tour. So we are going to have our first stop is at the university at Quas Quest, where Sir Woodville is going to give a short presentation on the history of that state, that area that became the university, the families, the who live there and so on. And then we are going to be moving northwards. Uh, our, our next stop would include St. John the Baptist Church, where we are going to hear from Morris Greenwich, who have been doing a project on that Holders Hill area, the, the cricketing talent that came out of that area. And then we are also going to have someone who will share about their family from that Hoyts Village area. And then another stop will be St. James Parish Church, we're also going to Bax Rock, and we hope to get a closer look at the Indian River Monument. So it, it should be a very good day with persons sharing about their family histories. So if you're interested, just let me know. Um, tickets are available, so you just let me know. Lunch, our lunch on that day will be at Chris's Place on Rock Dando in St. James. So please indicate your interest. So that's the bus tour. Our other reminder is the library. Now, when we launched this group in 2014, persons wanted to have access to the library on Saturdays. And because of that, I trained a number of persons, and the library is open on the second and fourth Saturdays of the month from January until November. So I just want to remind you of that. The library is open from nine until one on the second and fourth Saturdays of the month. You also ask for Ancestry.com, which we also have available in the library. So just remember, it makes no sense having these things if you do not make full use of them. So there, there, there are the reminders for today. The, I also want to, today, actually, we are launching our connections. It is volume three, number two. And this is the first one that our new education officer has put together, new information officer has put together, Nicholas Mears. So I'll just call him to tell you a bit about connections. I think it's a really good um, presentation. So we want to thank Nicholas and let you know that once we have your email address, it will be circulated electronically. So Nicholas.
Good evening to everyone. All right, well, I'm here to introduce you to this year's publication of the Connections Newsletter. And I'm sure that this will be interesting reading for everyone. On the first page, we have the, a review of the Barbados, Mercury, and, Bridget and Bridgetown Gazette. And this is the, a review of the earliest copy of the newspaper, which spans from 1783 to 1848. So this should be interesting re reading pertaining to the information which is available in that newspaper. And on page two, there is, there is a, there is an article on the Bajan Garbia. It's now this year, 2019. This would, this would mark 100 years. Well, 100 years ago, there was the introduction of the, of the Universal Negro Improvement Associ Association, which is noted as the UNIA, and that was introduced to Barbados back in 1919, 100 years ago. So there is an, there is an article featuring the beginning of that, of that organization in Barbados. And also there is information pertaining to death registers, which, per, which contains information pertaining to the death of persons between the year 1925 to 1971. So if you want to know the cause of death of your ancestors between that time, between that time period, you are welcome to take a look at the death register. So I would invite you to get a copy of our Connections newsletter. And I believe that it is time to introduce our speaker. Or? Uh, I just wanted to. <laughs> yes, I thought that I should also add to what Nicholas said on the back page. There's actually an article written by Dr. Stafford about the slave registers, which are free again. And I thought I should draw this to your attention because um, Dr. Stafford, as a member of the genealogy group, um, made a uh, submission to the British Archives because the slave registered has become part of the subscription service at Ancestry. And so because of that, they are now free again. So this is also part of the advocacy mandate of the genealogy group. Uh, in addition, if you are interested in making a contribution to the next Connections, which is due in September, feel free to contact me or contact Nicholas. Uh, the articles could be about 250 words, um, no longer. So just contact us if you're interested. Um, we will welcome any submissions. Thank you very much. So we will get down to the meat of the matter. So Nicholas will introduce our speaker. It is my pleasure to, int to introduce this evening our featured speaker, Ms. Marcia Nurse. Ms. Nurse has engaged in genealogical research for over 30 years, which has led her to discover noted historical figures in her family lineage, such as Amaryllis Collimore. Through her research, she has become quite knowledgeable of the various sources of information and research technique techniques which she willingly shares with persons who seek to engage in this quest. She is also well read in local history and is able to inform persons of the social context, of the social context within, which her, within which their ancestors lived. As an avid supporter of the Barbados ge genealogy group, she willingly volunteers to make presentations about her, about her ancestors and her research techniques. This evening, we can be assured that in her unique style, she will expose very detailed archival evidence that traces the social evolution of her ancestors within a Barbadian society that was emerging from the background of chattel enslavement. Her presentation mirrors archival research she completed for her, for her paper, Valdemir Eustace Sinclair Cobham, Portrait of a Family, 1700 to 1924. 
This paper was published in the 2018 Journal of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. Now, before any further ado, I now invite Miss Marcia Nurse to deliver her presentation on Journey to the Ancestors. Thank you, Nicholas, for that introduction. Thank you, Harriet, and the committee for inviting me to make the presentation this evening. Welcome all you who have taken out your time to attend this evening as we journey to the ancestors. Family research can be viewed as a journey where paths emerge and a choice is offered to, one, venture along a path, meet an ancestor, place him or her in a box, and add a connecting line with a date of authentic birth, maybe marriage, and death, continuing in this manner until one has created a tree-like image, also known as a family tree. Or two, venture along a path, meet an ancestor, and closely examine their uh, re records and analyze these for clues to the individual's place within the historical landscape. Document your findings. Either method allows individuals to undertake a journey which may connect them to familiar Barbadian links pre-emancipation and post-emancipation. Such a journey will introduce the enslaved, the enslavers, and other free men, women, and children. These persons will undoubtedly form links to one's surname legacy. Along the way, one may better understand why Barbados has been deemed by eminent historians Little England and the First Black Slave Society. The merging of both research patterns offers family researchers an opportunity to confront realities of their ancestors' places within a Barbadian socio-historical and socio-economic context. This evening's journey displays archival data relevant to the lives of a son, a father, grandfather, possible great-grandfather, these men will offer a snapshot of their wives, mothers, possible consorts, and some associates. The archive data, data is extracted from both locally archived and online records. The first and second of these four men to be met inherited the paternal surname Cobham in 1888 and 1885. The third and fourth men were identified with the Christian name, with the Christian name Thornhill in 1817 and 1832, with the latter surnamed Thornhill Cobham by 1854. Both surnames, Thornhill and Cobham, hold a place on the early Barbadian landscape, since white British and white Creole Barbadians bearing these surnames owned between the 1600s to the 1800s several hundred acres of land, and hence they owned several enslaved laborers. On early Barbadian maps and archival documents, the parishes predominantly associated with these two surnames, Thornhill and Cobham, are St. Lucy, St. Peter, St. James, St. Thomas, and St. George. Apart from these large property owners, Maps and wills of mid-1600 to the first half of the 1700s show Cobhams who practiced the Quaker religion. They owned small acreages in St. Andrew. Stepney Plantation in St. George, 1719 to 1817, and Applewitz Plantation bordering St. George, St. Thomas, 1817 to the 1900s, was owned by Cobhams. Thus, in the pre-emancipation period, pre-August 1st, 1834, there are a few enslaved persons who were inventoried with the enslavers' identification marks of Thornhill and Cobham. These easily recognized surnames were classified under Christian names, evidenced on church baptism records. Post-emancipation, post-August 1, 1834, some such persons, so named, continued use of both their pre-emancipation names, and these became the Christian and surnames recorded by the church and other authorities. 
Across the island, other free persons discontinued with the use of their name names from the period of enslavement and took a new identity, two new names. Some persons with only one name never attached a surname and are recorded buried with one name, no European surname. In researching during these periods, it should be noted that most enslaved persons only bore one name. Also in conducting Barbadian family research journeys, one must be cognizant that one's present day pigmentation may not bond one exclusively to a specific racial group, commonly referred to nowadays as white and black. Experience at the local archives proves that many white of all hues, local and overseas based Barbadians have a black ancestor, all hues. And many black of all hues, local and overseas based Barbadians have a white ancestor, all hues. While researching, it is important to note that pre-emancipation archive records pre-1834 show that enslaved persons were recorded as black, mulatto, colored, and Negro. And other records show free persons of color as FB, free black, FM, free mulatto, FC, free colored, and FN, free Negro. If a record in the described period prior to 1834 does not have these designations, then the individual under examination was racially white. Further proof of African and European ancestral blood lines can be obtained through DNA tests. Such a procedure will ground persons with Barbadian ancestors, sorry, with Barbadian ancestral ties to another reality of who they are genetically on the world's DNA landscape. All of the aforementioned European surnames on the Barbadian landscape and slavers' marks of identification, racial and national classifications, records of births, marriages, and deaths will all play a part in our journey to the ancestors. Genealogy is described as a process by which historical records and genetic analysis are used to determine kingship or family connections. And as I just stated, there are two methods that persons use. Either you just place somebody in a box and put a connecting line, or you create a narrative. On our journey, we have to go to the Barbados Department of Archives, and there you will find a number of records. Baptisms, 1637 to 1903. Marriages, 1643 to 1912. Burials, 1643 to 1921. Deaths, 1925 to 1970. Wills, 1647 to 1959. Original proof wills, 1860 to 1959. Original file wills, 1820 to 1859. Some other original records you may need to look at are deeds, and these all play a part in the information this evening. Inventories, 1764 to 1888. Voters list, 1867 to 1969. And census records, which are available 1679, 70 to about 20, 1715. Now, much of, um, of what I said, um, is indicative that persons' surnames were created at the point of 1834 and thereafter. And when I say that, I'm speaking of the masses in Barbados, and that influences what we today know as our surnames. At 1834, 82,807 persons were enslaved in Barbados. And um, the word condition here speaks to work, and the word is taken directly from the enslavers' registers prepared between 1817 and 1834. Now, um, here we see domestics at 10,734, laborers in cult sugar cultivation at 40,965, laborers in cotton and other conditions, 4,825, 
laborers not employed in agriculture, 9,635, and persons under the classification none, 16,648. These would be infants and persons, decrepit, invalid, very old persons. Um, when we look at the ages of the persons enslaved, we see at 1834, under six years, 11,047, from six years to 12 years, 11,987, from 12 to 24 years, 15,573, from 21 to 50, 35, 665, and 50 years and onwards, 88,544. 8, now, this is very important because it, it gives you a good picture of how many people were looking to establish an identity. 82,000 persons plus were eager to establish an identity. During the period 1854 to 1898, I've highlighted some of the events that impacted the masses in Barbados. And they speak of, the, the events could easily be under one title, the starving years. And destitution, famine, mayhem, and death were the order of the day for these 82 plus, 82,000 plus persons. And a number of events occurred, and these also impact on your research. 1854 cholera epidemic, approximately as stated by authorities, 30,000 people died within a three month period. And a lot of these persons were buried in mass burials. And some of them, their names might not even be recorded in the burial records of the churches of the day, which was predominantly the Church of England. The other area that we look at is how many people were hungry, how many people were um, it was a, a terrible time in Barbados. Hardship was across the island. And the culmination of, uh, of the period after emancipation, there was a, cul cul a culmination at 1876, which was and is known as the War of General Green, and it related to the Federation riots. Um, going on into 1887, 1894, 1898, you can clearly see that across the island, um, the order of the day was destitution. And I've highlighted these peers because the three gentlemen that we're going to meet, the four gentlemen in fact, and the fourth is, a, is in a gray box, so to speak, um, they all lived within these peers at different times in their lives. The first gentleman we meet is the son. As I indicated, it's a son, father, grandfather, and possible great-grandfather that we will meet this evening. Valdemar Eustace Sinclair Cobham was born 12 years after what is termed the rebellion of General, with General Green as the leader. And it is remarkable that by 1906, between 1906 and 1910, he was apprentice clerk and student of law. He was born on the 3rd of August, 1888. He was baptized the 7th of October, 1888 at St. Matthew's Church. And his parents are named as Charles James Fox Cobham and Margaret Elizabeth Cobham. Here you can see the influence of, of Great Britain, of course, in the names. Charles James Fox Cobham was actually an ab abolitionist who had um, several run-ins with Charles II, I think it is. Um, Valdemar's parents' marriage record, which has been transcribed here um, to the, by the folks at the registry and the folks at the archives, clearly shows his parents' marriage on the 16th of September, 1886. Charles James Fox Cobham is recorded as married. He was a tailor, 27 years old, living in Hinesbury Road in St. Michael. And Margaret Elizabeth Fox, the bride, is 19 years old, a spinster seamstress, Hinesbury Road. What is important here is to note that this um, gentleman was able to be married in the cathedral, and this is mere of 50 years after that um, emancipation period. So this is quite a statement because the cathedral was the domain of the very wealthy whites of Barbados. Margaret Elizabeth, is declared as 19 years old, a seamstress, a spinster, also of Hinesbury Road. Now also on this record, 
you'll see that Charles James Fox Cobham could sign his name. On the original, he signed. Remember, this is a transcript of the original. And you see the mark of X, Margaret E. Ward. She was illiterate. So these are the types of things you can pick up on a marriage record. And we see that the witnesses were William Henry Ferguson and Benjamin Agard. And William Henry Ferguson has been traced to St. Joseph. He was the elderly gentleman at this point, and he was obviously probably a very close friend of the family. Now, the other important aspect of this um, record is that we see that Charles James Fox Cobham declares that his father is Samuel Thornhill Cobham. So an introduction to another surname is made here, and we are also introduced to the grandfather in our journey this evening. And he is described as a sub-emigration agent, and I'll speak to that later. But that's also a very important point. So we're looking at both the surname connections, the family connections, the socio-historical and the socio-economic situation of this family. To give an insight into Charles James Fox Cobham, he was born on the 18th of June, 1859. He was the third of 12 children born between the period 1855 to 78 to his married parents at Suriname in St. Joseph. Um, the, words, the name Suriname also has very interesting history and you should also try to read that um, at some point. A number of his siblings died in infancy from dysentery and interestingly enough, I saw that written in small print on the actual burial record of the St. Joseph Forest Church. The couple, as you saw, were married um, in 1886, and three days after their marriage, Charles Telney Blanco, their first son, was born. So that's another interesting aspect of this, and the fact that they entered the cathedral and got married. Um, he died 22 days after he was born. Valdemar is known to be an only child. Valdemar's baptism record, however, recorded his mother's maiden name as Went. And you would have seen on her marriage, she declared her name as Ward. And on Charles, the first child's um, baptism, he, she declared her maiden name as Ward. So we can see that there's some interesting information about Margaret Elizabeth because she actually was baptized as Smith. She's known in the family oral history as a Smith. And um, that then leads us into another direction, but we're not going there this evening. Um, in his life, Charles worked as a tailor in 1886 and a shopkeeper by 1912, and we know that because his will showed that he was a shopkeeper. So it's very important to pay attention to such details. He was a taxpayer for property in Hinesbury Road, where the couple lived. He wrote a will in November 1911, his wife was a beneficiary, his son was an executor, he's buried on the 1st of January, age 52, at Westbury Cemetery. So in that um, information, you can see what a story you could write about an ancestor if you were using that data. Now here we're introduced um, by a pictorial presentation of Margaret Elizabeth Cobham, and this picture was taken in 1912. She took some of the money she inherited and went to a studio here in Barbados and took this photograph. And as you can see, she's mimicking Victoria, Queen Victoria, while her full British attire, even black gloves. And we see Valdemar at um, 34 years old in 1922. And he's in his, um, as he was in 1906 and 1910, his high collar, tie, waistcoat and jacket. So this is another interesting um, insight to Barbados and the British influence on Barbados and on Afro-Barbadians. Afro um, the photograph of Valdemar was taken at Percy Matthews studio and he was a renowned photographer at that time. And there's information also docu documented on photography. Now, we were introduced to Samuel Thornhill on the marriage record of his son, Charles James Fox. So we have a look at him. And we start with his death in St. Michael in 1898, age 66. And he's buried at St. Joseph's Paris Church. During his lifetime, he's married at St. Joseph's Paris Church to Henrietta Francis Quinton on the 22nd of April, 1854. And the name Quinton is directly tied to Quinton's plantation 
which was known at that time in St. Joseph. It borders St. Joseph, St. John, just near the Codrington Estates, which became Codrington College. Her, mother, her father and her grandfather were owned by Henry Quinton and Reverend Henry Quinton of that plantation. The occupations between 1855 and 78 was mail carrier and postman, and this was picked up off of the baptism records of his children. On the parochial tax papers available at the Department of Archives, he paid taxes in 1882 for the Hand to Heart Society, and that's a friendly society. And other land taxes at Bank Hall and Hinesbury Road, it would appear from what I saw that he may have been paying for persons who were overseas. And um, friendly societies, as you know, were financial institutions for black, that were formed by black men who were looking for avenues for financial investment. And it helped families with burials and during sickness. At his death in 1898, the burial record indicated that he was secretary to Land Agency Association. So the grandfather, Samuel Thornhill, is involved in assisting people in buying land. Now I say he's born enslaved in 1832, and I know you want to know, well, how can I make that statement? If we subtract 66 from 1898, we get 1832. Everyone can do that. But I'm now going to take you on a journey into 1834 and the periods just before. In 1834, as you saw, 82,807 persons were enslaved. The parishes that we're journeying to this evening are St. Michael, St. George, and St. Joseph. Not in that order, but these are the parishes that we'll be journeying to. And you can see that St. Michael has the highest number of the three followed by St. George and then St. Joseph. St. Joseph is also the smallest parish in Barbados and the last parish to be formed. It was a very difficult parish for um, persons to um, have plantations because of the terrain. And you can just imagine what it was like when Samuel Thornhill was a postman and mail carrier. No roads, no motorbikes, no bicycles, and probably not a horse or a donkey. And he probably had to also run from or walk from St. Joseph to St. George to perhaps collect the mail that came in, which would be for the church, and then take it to all the plantations. And there were over 20 plantations in St. Joseph because those were the persons who would be receiving mail, no one else, not poor whites or poor blacks. So we go to 1832, and the first stop we make is St. George Parish Church. And I hope you can see the arrows. Um, the baptism of, of Slaves solemnized in the parish of St. George in the island of Barbados in the year 1832. That is the heading at the top of the book. And here we see that we find a, a, an infant, Samuel Thornhill, baptized the 11th of November. His mother is named as Mimbo Will, the abode is Valley, and the quality, meaning his status in society, is infant slave of James M. Allen, and by whom the sermon is performed, Reverend Pinder. Now, James M. Allen was James Mac Allen, and he was the father of Reverend Henry Allen, Francis Jones, and Maria Roberts of the Valley Plantation. James Mac Allen was dead in 1825, but the church still recognized him as the owner of the plantation because it was still going through the process. And his inventory valued Mimbowilla at 140 pounds. His entire estate was valued at 23 pounds, 900 sorry, 23,951 pounds and 10 shillings. That information is available at the Department of Archives. His will can be read as well as his inventory. So this gives you an idea of the socioeconomic situation for black enslaved persons and obviously for the enslavers, what the goal was here. We stay in St. George, and I take you now to the registers of enslaved persons. And I know this might be a first for many people here, and I, would, and I do appreciate how it must be um, quite a stunning experience, an emotional experience for you. I experience the same thing every time I look at these registers. Registers exist for every parish across Barbados, and they list all the enslaved persons, and they also list the enslavers, and it would seem that the British personnel were sent out here to do this exercise. The top of each page will say cause of increase, decrease, 
sex, male or female, name, age, color, country, employment, and in 1830, 42 categories were domestic or laborer, but records before this might state next to the person's name, Cooper, um, gang, lead, gang leader, cook, etc. Um, on the return of George Hewitt of slaves, the joint property of Francis Jones, the Reverend Henry Allen, deceased Mary L. Roberts, to whom he is attorney, we find that, and I'm sharing these two names with you before we move on to, this, to, to page 138, we're not page 136, 37. We see that the oldest male, I did a, a, a look through each of these names, is 62-year-old Joe, which attests to what I said earlier, that most enslaved persons had one name. But we also see that the oldest enslaved person was 74-year-old Betty Jones. She's carrying that name as a, as a Christian name. We recognize it as a surname, and we would also recognize that she's tied directly to Francis Jones and her husband. Francis Jones, the Reverend Henry Allen, and Robert L. Sorry, Mary L. Roberts are sisters and brother. Okay. Um, the other thing I just want to share with you is that children over three years were grass pickers. So you see on records prior to 1834, not this record, that they say grass picker next to the children's names. And from seven years and up, they all have an L next to them as fee laborers. We stay in St. George and we turn the page, the registers of St. George, and we see on page 138 that we found um, Sam Thornhill, who was baptized at the St. George Parish Church. We find him on his enslavers register, and he's aged to color black country Barbadian. And we see Mimbo Will, his mother, second from the bottom, she's aged 36, color black country Barbadian employment laborer. So verification here, um, the enslavers have verification both through the church record and through the um, registration records, and this will assist them at 1834 to receive payment for these enslaved persons. Uh, we have now to move to St. Joseph, and in St. Joseph we also find that the return of George Hunter Turney of slaves, the property of Charlotte Nesfield, an invalid. And Charlotte Nesfield, in 1834, declares that she owns Sarah Massey, 31 years old, black Barbadian, Mary, 13, black Barbadian, Dolly, seven colored, Francis Hanley, three black, three years old, black, and Sam Thornhill, two years, black Barbadian. So there's, there's another infant registered here on a record with the same name, Samuel Thornhill. Now, the registers have a total at the end of each person's registration. So in her case, she's registering five persons, but at the time that the enumerator is doing this exercise, she has a newborn, and he's also listed. His name is given as George Hunter. And he then brings the total to six. I must state that Charlotte Nesby received no compensation. She died in 1837. Now, also in St. In Joseph, we find that we're meeting Sam Thornhill, an enslaved man. And I took the opportunity to look at Sam Thornhill and journey back in time with him to 1817. And on the 1817 registers, I found him at 12 years old, Charles, owned at that time by Charles Cadogan, who owned Blackman's Plantation. I then found him three years later, 15, and he's now owned by Philip Applewith, who's bought the plantation and all the persons there. Um, in 1834, he's now owned by John Wrightcott Best, a very renowned character in Barbados, and he's age 29. So you can see that chronologically, um, this is the same person and how astute the recording was. Sam Thornhill is recorded as with an adult baptism in May 1836, still at Blackman's Plantation, he's now an apprentice laborer because after the emancipation in 1834, everyone over, um, over six years old became an apprentice laborer and was still tied to the plantation. He was buried in June 1836 St. Joseph, so he probably knew he was dying and was convinced that he should have baptism so he would have a proper burial. The priest put his age as 40, we know 
that he would have been 31, but the priest just rounded it up. And you have to be conscious of this when you're doing research, even after this period, that um, ages could be skewed a bit. Now, how did 1832 born Samuel Thornhill, whichever infant he is, become Samuel Thornhill Cobham? In the journal, in the paper I submitted to the journal, 2018 Museum Journal, I made the statement, did not transfer through blood or bondage. How could I be so bold to make this statement? Well, the research proved it. In July 1834, Sarah Massey, who you would recall was on Charlotte Nesfield's claim, she is baptized and her name is Sarah Mercy Nesfield. She takes the surname of her enslaver, Charlotte. And she says that she lives at Turney's. Well, we can imagine where she lives. And I have also proved that because I've read George Hunter Turney's will. On the 23rd of May, 1835, Sarah Mercy Nesfield marries Cobina Cobham, an apprentice laborer whose abode was near Lamin's St. Joseph. By 1840, Cobina Cobham is recorded as a sexton living up near Lamin's. And this is very important. Cobina has employment through the church. It would be a nominal wage, but he's not an apprentice laborer now. Apprenticeship is finished. He's out of the fields, and he's now a sexton at the church. And this is the avenue that opens many doors within this family. Um, the records show that the couple had four children during their marriage. However, also, two children located post-emancipation from Charlotte Nesfield's fifth failed 1834 returns continued in the care of Sarah Mercy, the wife of Cabina Cobham. Francis Hanley, you remember her, was, who was three years, and Samuel Thornhill, who, were, who was two years old. They later have the surname Cobham, and they continue to live in St. Joseph. So they're not the children of Cabina. Because of the marriage, they then later in life use that name. In, front, in fact, Francis Hanley becomes a domestic at Little Island um, Plantation, which is owned by A.R. R. Henley. Um, it is, I'm pretty confident that the spelling on the register was also askew, and it should be Henley. Um, Samuel Thornhill is married, as you remember, in 1854, and he takes the name Cobham. Now, what about Cabina and what about Cobham? And I, um, Cobham is another paper, not this paper, but uh, I'm just going to give you an insight which will help you also in a journey if you have to take this path. In 1829, on the return of Lucretia Turney, slaves her own property, it states at the top, reverted to her by death of John H. Turney. Now, John H. Turney was her husband and he died um, in 1823 and he had a will and in his will he has 37 enslaved persons that is available to be viewed at the archives and one of the persons is a man called Cobina who is 39 years old in 1829 and it's spelt slightly different to how the priest spells it down the road on the, on the enumerator but also she declares that she had in total by 1829, six years later, um, Lucretia indicates that she now has 17 persons comprising of eight males and seven females. And when the, the um, enumerator was taking the details, she also declares that she has, um, that she sells three males and six females to Abbas Turney, who is her relative. And she gives one male and two females to Abbas Turney. But she says, the record, and the record captures this, she says, sold to G.H. Turney, one male, John Thomas, 28 years, colored. She sold to Joseph T. Smith, one male, Joseph, 12 and a half years. So that accounts for 14 people. So we know that in 1829, Lucretia is saying she's only maintaining two enslaved persons. Now, by 1832, um, Lucretia is dead. She actually dies later in 1829. And I have that record as well. The 1832 return of George Hunter Turney of slaves, the property of Lucretia Turney deceased, who he is legal representative. So George Hunter Turney not only is representing Charlotte Nesfield, 
um, she, in 1832 and 34. He's represented in 1832, um, Lucretia Turney. And he um, says, number last registration, two males, one female, three, which tallies back here. And then he says, gifted to G.H. Turney, one Marianne, 58, Black Barbadian, and one Cabina, 42, Black Barbadian. Death, one male, John. So that is how Cabina comes into the um, ownership or George Hunter Turney, who, as you know, um, is associated, associated with Charlotte Nesfield, who owns Sarah Mer Mercy, who marries Cabina. So in 1832, by law, George Hunter Turney has to declare who he owns. So he has the state. He has one male, which would be John Thomas, who he bought from Lucretia back in 1829. But now he has the state gift of Lucretia Turney, one female, Marianne, 58, black Barbadian, one male, Cobina, 42, black Barbadian. And he also states, manumitted, one female, Marianne, 58, so he decreases his total by one and he has two persons. So the story here is that Marianne, 58 years old, was manumitted. George Hunter Turney is a poor man. So was Charlotte Nesfield, not a plantation owner. But he has enough money to manumit Marianne, which will become a story on its own. Now, Cobina is has to be, um, and John Thomas, have to be declared in 1834, and on the 1834 return, George Hunt Attorney declares them John Thomas colored and Cobina black, 44 and 34 years old. So George Hunt Attorney um, declares two enslaved persons, and he, George Hunt Attorney died in 1836. He received his compensation from the British government for his two persons, just over 53 pounds and some shillings and pence. That record is available online. Now, the biggest surprise for me, and all of that information that I, that I showed you just now, I used to prepare the, um, the paper I submitted for the journal. And 14 nights ago, I was checking again on FamilySearch.org because all of these earlier records are closed at the archives, so you cannot see them. You have to um, depend on FamilySearch.org who scanned a lot of these records and they're uploading them, uploading them all the time. And this piece of information changes part of the, the, the um, paper I submitted to the journal. So I know you'll read the journal and then you'll reflect on this. 14 nights ago, around 9 p.m. at night, I found, when I, I always go back on gray areas every two, three months to check if anything new has been uploaded. And to my surprise, Sam Thornhill was baptized in St. Joseph. An infant, June the 24th. His mother's name, Sarah Mercy. No abode was given, and it said, slaves of Charlotte Nesfield. So this was the final piece to the puzzle that I was trying to put together with regards to the fact that there was an infant in St. George, but there was none in St. Joseph. Now, um, fathers were not recognized pre-emancipation and could not be named. Um, enslaved persons, as I said, had no surname. If they had a name and we recognize it as a surname, it was placed on the Christian name in the baptism books of all the churches. And therefore, the window is open for Samuel Thornhill later on. And that window is open because his father would have been powerless to give his names. And we can imagine and who the possible great-grandfather is. And it is through him that Samuel Thornhill can take the name Cobham years later as an adult because he was completely powerless to give the infant his names. They obviously, the mother and father wanted the name Samuel Thornhill to be with this infant. She could have chosen Samuel Nesfield. She could have chosen anything else. So we have to pay due respect here to Sarah Mercy. We ask ourselves if we stop and say to Valdemar, remember Valdemar was the person that we met 
when we started this journey. And we say to him, how did you become a solicitor in 1910 in Barbados with such a historical background and such an ancestry? It was practically impossible for the masses to get any education. If you read the history by the modern Barbadian uh, historians, you'll see the true story of, of education in Barbados. Don't be fooled that, oh, you know, so many people were educated pre and post emancipation. That's not true. The statistics are here to prove it. I actually have some statistics on St. Joseph. So somehow, Valdemar receives an elementary education I have proof that he went to Combermere Mare because I found that in the education books, minutes of the education board. And I also was able to find all the exams and what his parents had to do, all the British exams he had to take under the regulations to become a solicitor. And I transcribed some of that in the journal, which I'm sure you'll all go to the museum bookshop and get a copy or have it mailed to you. And Valdemar here is shown um, in the official gazette, which is, is the uh, mouthpiece of the House of Assembly in Barbados, of the government. He's shown as achieved his goal to become a solicitor at 1910. Oops. Oops. What ha happened there? Sorry. So I think what you're seeing here um, is evidence of the tremendous amount of data that's available at the Barbados Department of Archives, um, online on sites such as Ancestry.com, FamilySearch.org, and um, you also have Ellis Island, um, the Ellis Island records that you can look at. Um, this, story, this story is the story of many Barbadian families um, across Barbados today. In the 1930 Handbook of Solicitors, we also see that he's listed here, the fifth from the top, and um, he's listed and we see that he's working with Mr. Malby Trimingham, and this data supports the oral history that the family knew. And I speak to um, so, social, um, social aspects of the fact that he was listed in the Solicitor's Handbook of 1913. Now, um, Valdemar marries at 24 years old. He's now as two years into his profession in 1912. On the 17th of September, he marries Iris Cullimer, and she's 27 years old, a spinster of Barbary Hill. He's a solicitor, Hinesbury Road. Now, what is remarkable is that they marry at St. James, sorry, James Street Wesleyan Methodist Church, and this is a break from paternal links. Um, the paternal links were very strong with the Church of England. We also see that neither of them declare their father's um, names or their professions. Um, you know, Valdemar's father died at 1912. And the other point I, I wanted to mention with the previous slides was that um, Valdemir was baptized Valdemir, V-A-L-D-I-M-I-R. He was also recorded in the Education Minute books as Valdemir when they first listed him as having the opportunity to be given um, an exhibition to Combermere. However, the first legal record, the first evidence that his name changed to Valdemar was shown when the government announced that he became a solicitor. He continues to use Valdemar from here on in. So you'll see that switch in his spelling. And he marries Iris Cullimer, who's a spinster. Her father was the secretary to the education board. He was born in 1858. He, did, he died in 1894 when she was a very young child. She was born in um, 1885. Uh, 
During the marriage, the couple had four children, um, shown here, and this photograph was taken in 1922, Valdemar is 34 years old, and this is in River Road. Uh, however, I was able to track him through the parochial tax books and also the county deeds, and I saw the properties he bought, where he lived, etc., and I speak to that in the journal as well. The death notice of Valdemar, there were death notices in the newspapers, but I chose this one because it is so explicit on the story of Valdemar's death. And um, I'll, I'll read it out. Death of another solicitor, and of course that means investigation as well. Who is the other solicitor? The death occurred on Sunday morning at his late residence in River Road of Mr. V. Cobham, solicitor, and for a number of years connected with the office of Mr. M. Trimingham. Mr. Cobham was a young man in apparent enjoyment of the best health, but took ill rather suddenly a few months ago and at once gave fear as to his recovery. He suffered from a severe attack of brights, and although always brave in his afflictions, was seen by those who comforted him in his period of suffering to be gradually sinking. A devoted wife who bore her burden of despair while nursing him with true womanly character had just completed her attentions to him and turned aside when her trained ear caught a strange sigh emitted by the sufferer, and on hastening to his side discovered that the end had come. His remains were interred at the Westbury Cemetery yesterday evening, where they were followed by many sympathetic friends and comrades of his profession. Besides his young widow, he leaves four children to feel the need of a father's support and protection. There are a number of uh, interesting things to be picked up in that announcement. Valdemar Eustace Cobham died, as we saw, in 1924. 2019, his descendants carry his DNA. 14 of his 16 grandchildren are alive. I am one of those. 13 of his 14 great-grandchildren are alive, and five great-great-grandchildren are alive. The legacy of all the men you met this evening continues today. Their DNA legacy. Now, these are some helpful tips. I know we have some old timers here with the genealogy group, but we have some new people as well, so I thought I'd include this. Recall and listen to oral histories. Collect, sort, and consult old documents. Preserve edit every document that you have and every photograph in 100% acid free sleeves and boxes and store in a dark place. Start with you and list the family members backward. Choose one person, as I showed you just now, and just analyze everything about that person and their ancestors. Document all you find in note form, electronic with backup copies. Other important records that you may need to look at are passenger records and employment records related to the Panama, the movement of persons into Panama, familysearch.org, immigrant records at the Barbados Department of Archives, Military records for World War I and World War II are very important because your ancestor may never have returned to Barbados. He might have died overseas. U.S. Immigration Naturalization Records, FamilySearch.org, Ancestry.com, EllisIsland.org, Newspapers, Directories, Education Records, Minutes of the Education Board. And these directories here on FamilySearch.org for the USA relate to not telephone numbers, but persons and what they did in the United States and where they lived. And they're normally between the period of like First World War, First World, World War I and II, and, and continuing. So the depositories we all know are the Barbados Department of Archives, the Registry Department, the Public Library, the Sydney Martin Library at UE, the Shilston Library here at the museum, Ancestry.com, FamilySearch.org, Island, EllisIsland.org, and CaribbeanFamilyHistory.org. I would have drawn on practically all of these for this research. Now there are some important future events and um, research, doing research of this nature, um, I, I don't think you could do it without pausing to think about these events. February 17, 1627, 
the 1st of August, 1834, and August the 1st, 1838. The events of 1627, 1834, and 1838 had a profound impact on the island's social and economic history, individual family history, especially for the creation of identification through a surname. The family surname legacy across Barbados is enveloped by these events, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Likewise, how we come to terms individually as a family and as a nation with those events will determine much about how individuals and the country will or will not celebrate in 2027, 2034, and 2038. I am confident that private family researchers, professional family researchers, the museum, the genealogy group, and the archives will have achieved a cohesive synergy journeying to these years. And one of the bases for achieving same will lie in a greater societal awareness, engagement, researching, and sharing personal family journeys from pre-emancipation to the 21st century. Forums such as this allows and will allow for the stimulation of thoughts and should offer inspiration towards exploring and documenting individual family genealogy. Furthermore, such exposures will support the expanded inclusion of Barbadian genealogy as an integral segment of heritage tourism. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. I think we owe Marcia another round of applause. Okay, the floor is now open for any questions or comments. I'm sure um, Marcia's journey to her ancestors also gave us a lot of food for thought. So you can now ask a question or make a comment. Thanks, Natasha. Kobina, um, that you are correct in the origin of the name Kobina. Um, Kobina is described as Black Barbadian, so he was born in Barbados. Um, these records, um, these registers, if you are an African born, it would say African. If you were enslaved and born in Martinique, it would say Martinique. I've seen um, on these registers individuals and their um, nationality is um, Martinican, Suriname, from Suriname, from Africa, African. So you are correct, the name Kabina is the Akan name originating um, in Africa. Kabina is a Barbadian, is described as a Barbadian. And that opens another area of discussion, which I don't think we'll do tonight. But um, of those 82,000 persons plus, persons who were enslaved, the bulk of those persons are described as Barbadian. The records only show what we consider a handful to 82, compared to 82,000 of persons who are described on the records as African. So we're speaking here of generational enslavement. Many persons that I have met over the years seem to think, um, and, and, and this especially was what I heard as a child, as a young person. Um, if you said that someone, anything about Africa, they said, well, Africa has nothing to do with me, I'm a Barbadian. Now, um, this can also have been generationally instilled that you were Barbadian, so even if in your family oral history, you knew that your enslaved ancestor, you heard your enslaved ancestor was African, a choice might have been made to say Barbadian. It's all part of the influencing. 
But certainly on the registers between 1817 to 1834, there are a number of persons with recognizable African names. Their nationality is shown as Barbadians, so they're born here. It could speak to the fact that their parents are born in Africa and enslaved and brought here. It could speak to that their grandparents were, or their great-grandparents. It speaks to the fact that by this period, 1817 to 1834, most enslaved persons were nationality Barbadian, born on the island. Valdemir. Um, that comes Brights. Right. What is that? Um, Brights would be mo the modern day, um, the modern day the illness would be nephritis, nephritis, um, kidney disease um, due to high blood pressure, and it would also cause massive heart attack. I encourage you to get the journal and read what I say there too. You just stand. I can't choose you. Someone here may be able to do that with it. I'd like to congratulate you on your incredible research, but also to ask how do you get information transcribed now onto certificates? Right. Uh, what you have to do, you have to be sure you have some basic information. Right. And you go to the registry and you go to the um, receptionist and you, there are blank forms for um, uh, death records, marriages, baptisms. And you fill your information out, you have to use your Barbados ID and your reason that you're doing and your, your relation to the person. In my case, sometimes I have to do it for other people, so I ask them to supply me with a letter. Um, and then you, you, su you submit that and they'll give you a date to come back. And I must warn you that it's not um, right away. It could be two weeks. And I've hesitated to go there in the last year when they moved to Warrens. So I'm waiting for them to resettle at White Park <laughs> before I venture into that arena again. And um, they tell you to come back and the counter opens at 11. My advice is to get there at 10 and you form the line. If not, you might find yourself there all day. And um, then they'll give you the information that's been transcribed. They request it from the archives. So it's very important to use familysearch.org when you're looking at the years that I was looking at. Because if the record is updated, you don't have to bother to go to the archives to hear um, that the book is closed. Um, so on familysearch.org, you're looking for a record, but you're looking for the record that has an image. A little camera icon will tell you that the image of the book that's actually at the archives, which is, and the archives book is sealed because it's too old, um, you now can get the data from Family Search. Now, if you can't get it that, that way, um, you might have to write an official letter to the um, head of the archives and see if um, she can retrieve this information from a closed book for you. Um, and then you, you, you know, if it's, it's like a dollar for certain years, five dollars, it's a very nominal amount of money you pay to have it transcribed to a marriage certificate. And I'm all for having that done, sorry, to a modern day certificate. I'm all for having that done because you have to recognize and the reason, one of the reasons I'm doing this is because these books are being closed. Yes, data is, you know, I'm depending on family search to have, have, to have scanned a record and now they're able to put it on their site and I'm able to download it. But the reality is that this, all of this data could be lost, right? And I'm also doing it because I have a daughter, I have nieces, I have cousins who have children, and we all need to know this. Um, we only had a faint idea. We knew about Valdemar. We knew about my grandfather. He was obviously dead long before I was born. My grandmother, I knew her. She died when she was 80-something years old. I was 11. And, um, you know, I always paid attention to a lot of things. And I lost my mother when I was 14. So um, a lot of information I gathered as a child just from observing. But I was very lucky that my aunt lived right into her 90s and she and I had 
tremendous discussion. I inherited from her all the photographs and documents that she had. And um, I'm busy searching among my, my um, second cousins, my cousin's children, to see who is that spark who will take over from me. <laughs> I think this gentleman has a question at the back in the cap. It means they're illiterate. And you also see it on the Panama records. A lot of the records are for persons who went to Panama in the 1900s or the late 1800s. And their employment records are online, some of them. Some of those records have an image of the person, a photograph, if it's a 1900 record. Some of them have fingerprints. And they have to sign their employment card. And it, they may not be able to, they may have an X. But on marriages, you'll see it all the time. You'll also see it in wills. So you don't only see it in enslaved persons, you see it in white persons who could not, um, could not read or write. Um, so you see it not only on marriages and on records that uh, enslaved persons and even freed persons had to, um, and after 1834. You see it going on back on wills. Yes, Frederick. Yes. First, let me congratulate you. Thanks, Frederick. Presentation. And um, just comments. The kind of late coach. Natasha? Yes, about African names. You know that the enslaved person in the list, the Colombian person, you have many other common names. But it also speaks to something that most Barbados have said or often thought that Black Barbados don't have any African culture. And there you see me being preserved. This is an important thing that Barbados should know that yes, aspects of, of the African culture were preserved. Some were being preserved, but some were less seen and they were hard. So that's an important thing that you should know. The other comment I want to make. We have the females group, and you just spoke of the fact that we are losing our roles. So one of the areas that the genealogy groups should consider is to become an African and encourage the persons who have the power to do something to Because you can't encourage heritage tourism. You can't encourage people to search for if we don't have the original authority. So part of the mandate of the genealogy group, in my opinion, I'm not saying you should be illiterate, but you should be able to advocate that you, know, you get some of these books fixed. Obviously, it can be done. The staff that they currently have is very heavy because they hardly have any staff. And of course, we're talking about encouraging skills. Here's an opportunity to set up developmental scholarships to intellectual partners. Frederick, you've made a lot of important points, and I knew that um, everyone here will pick up um, something from this presentation. Some persons may not be able to share um, right now. If they want to share with Harriet privately or myself, please do. Um, these also one of the important things about the African names. Um, they can tell you, as Natasha pointed out, they can speak to which area in Africa person's ancestry was. Natasha mentioned the Akan. And that is an important clue if you find that you come up on an ancestor with the name Kwashiba, Kobina. So there are several names there. And if you do your DNA, and the DNA results, as I have done, and the DNA results can give you the area in Africa. And then you know that information about your ancestors through that name. You have a very powerful tool there within your research. Heritage tourism, yes, this is all part of that story. 
and hopefully maybe someone from the relevant ministry might see a production like this and understand that the runaway slaves are important, but the ones on the 18, 17 to 34 records are the ones that will help Barbadians move forward in their knowledge and understanding of who they are and their identity. Yes, So what I said about going to the registry and going to the receptionist and getting a blank form, you can actually print them on the government websites. I think there was one more question. Yes, Martin. Thank you. I don't know if I missed it. Did you explain the adoption of the common surname? Yes, the common surname came to Samuel Thornhill, took that name. The first legal record of Samuel Thornhill using Cobham is in 1854 when he marries. And the reason he used it is because his mother, if we, we must take that his mother is Sarah Mercy because he's baptized in 1832 in St. Joseph Parr's Church, that record that I found on May the 1st, which is a huge day for me now, celebration um, he because of that marriage he grew up in the home of Kobina Cobham and his mother Sarah Mercy who married Kobina and he became a male carrier and he could only become a male carrier because Kobina was a sexton at the church um, so he takes the name Cobham, and illegally is recorded an 1854 baptism record. And he, he gets married at the same time, around the same time, that Cobina dies. Cobina dies in the cholera epidemic of 1854. Cobina was a sexton at the church, so Samuel had the opportunity to be the male carrier. Such a job was a reserve of whites, and it allowed Samuel Thornhill to have some nominal money, which obviously benefited Kabina, who was following now his four children with his wife, plus two, Samuel Thornhill and Francis Hanley. Francis Hanley also takes his surname Cobham. Uh, the other two named persons, Mary and Dolly, no proof has come up yet that they took the surname Cobham. So because he was raised and because he was not um, allowed to have a surname because he was a slave in 1832, owned by Charlotte Nasty, he simply took the name Cobham because he was raised under the roof of Cobina Cobham and Sarah Mercy. Why Cobina takes the name Cobham is not for tonight. That paper has not been disclosed as yet. <laughs> but Kobina is interesting because, I'll just say one more point. It's interesting because Kobina is enslaved in St. Michael. St. Michael is not a parish known for um, Cobums as enslavers. My opening introduction stated the parishes in St. Michael was not one. Cobina is brought from St. Michael into St. Joseph when it was purchased by George Hunter Turner from, sorry, when he's gifted, um, he's gifted Cobina because George, through Lucretia Turner who dies prior to 1832. So Cobina comes from St. Michael into St. Joseph. And it's very interesting because he's, he's a man, he's 30 something years old when he appears in 1832, being gifted from Lucretia to um, George Hunter Turner. The likelihood is that Cobina would father several children, either willingly or unwillingly, through the breeding program. And that's another paper. And 
he would have had children. But somehow, as a middle-aged man when he's in St. Joseph, he married Sarah Mercy, who is my ancestor. And through, she would have had, if all those children on that return of hers, at 1834, she would have had Mary, she would have had who is black, she would have had Dolly, who is colored. I think Dolly is colored. No, Dolly is black. Then she would have had Francis Hanley, who is colored. And then she would have had Samuel Thornhill, who is black. And then she had George Hunter. And because he's a newborn at 1834, they don't say what his, um, his color is. They just leave him, he's just newly born. But what is interesting, and I'll just say this about an infant called George Hunter. There's an infant called George Hunter on Char Charlotte Nesty's claim, which is submitted by George Hunter Turney in 1834. But there's also a George Hunter, newly born, at Bell Plantation, owned by Lord Harewood at the end of Lord Harewood's return, it says that the infant, newborn, George Hunter, is dead. Another paper. Yes, Nancy. Yes, I wanted to, to say thank you very much for your, your discussion this evening. It really um, opened a lot of little new areas that we can really offer into some I wanted again to mention it, Corbina. Um, you will have to know, first of all, the, some of the names. Um, people might see names in, in, in these and do not know that they are of African origin. So that is one of the questions. Uh, the second thing is that according to the, the books that are, uh, have been there before, and, and some of the historians have checked to say that there were about 62% of the enslaved persons' names that were Akan, 62% Akan at that period of time. But it does not necessarily mean that those persons came from Africa at that time. So the names were still being used Right. Generational, yeah. Right. It was a, a link. It was a link. So Kabina's parents could have been born in Africa, um, and and because they, um, his enslaver even allowed it. Um, and and when I say that, um, we must remember that a lot of enslavers in this period of time, 1870 to 84, are not the owners of the plantations. In this case, I'm speaking, are not even living here. So they have their bookkeeper, their manager, their overseer. And um, on, the, on these records, we're all not only dealing with plantations, and I think Barbadians, a lot of Barbadians don't know this, but the registers show individuals like Charlotte Nesquiel. And, and these individuals I showed as enslavers, yes, they're white because they don't have in brackets behind their name, FM or FN or FC, but on the registers between 1870 to 1834, there are a number of records. I have ancestors on the columnar side who are recorded on these records. And behind their name, it says FM, Free Malato, and they own a number of enslaved people. I've seen FN, Free Negro, and they own a number of enslaved people. I've seen FC, Free color and they own the number of enslaved persons. So it's not only white plantation owners living in Britain who have a plantation in Barbados being run by a manager of a seer and a bookkeeper. It's not only individual white Barbadians who go home, poor white Barbadians, or small planters, because you have small planters who take their things to large plantations. We also have free persons of color, only owning and same persons. And some of the records I've seen, I've thought to myself, you know, based on these ages and the colors, they may have four or five people. This is a family. This is a family. So 
Um, we need to be sensitive to all of this data, and we need to approach this data with understanding, with sensitivity. We need to appreciate it in the period it was, and we need to know how to use it effectively in our research and on a national level. I don't think there are any Barbadians here who don't have an ancestor who was, who was not probably enslaved or an enslaver. I have both in my family lines. I have, I have explored and researched both angles. It would be good to have some type of indexing system, but um, obviously that's not of my realm. I think there was one more question here that might be research related, or two or three. Uh, from what I read in history books, the total population was just about, I think, uh, between 120 some 130,000. Nancy, can you speak to that? Uh, I believe the enslaved persons were like two thirds of the population. Two thirds of the population were enslaved and therefore um, searching for identity in so many ways. Apart from, from the daily necessities um, and a, 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 apart from trying to, to um, survive under this apprenticeship system, which was no different to being enslaved, no different at all. Um, the fact of the matter is that uh, the first of August 1834, the totally free persons were only children up to the age of six years old. Everyone else became an apprentice laborer. And due to agitation, that whole system um, by law stopped in 1838. But then you had the um, Masters and Servants Act, the the whole um, labor laws, which kept people oppressed. So, you know, we have to thank all those people who rose up between 1854 that I showed and 1894, who rose up and rioted for food, who rose up and rioted for simple rights. The fact of the matter is nothing changed for enslaved persons. They were landless, it was a landless emancipation. And, and it came with strident, you know, put, put, the police force was established in 1835. And the first places that these police constabulary const const were placed were on plantations. And that's a vicious cycle there. And what occurred, you, you need to read, I know there are several history books, but I would really recommend that um, persons try to read um, the History of Barbados from Amerindian Settlement to Caribbean Single Market by Hilary Beckles because this is a true picture of Barbados, not the very stories that we have heard. I certainly knew none of this when I was growing up. I went to King's College and I learned by heart everything about, you know, Battle of Hastings, 1066, Henry VIII and everything. And if we can learn about Henry VIII and the cruelty he, he, he um, laid out to his wives, we can learn about this stuff, and we can, we can learn it just as well. Yeah. And, you know, we can, we can bring it on home to us, and, you know, strengthen our identity as a people. Yeah. What's the difference between color and mulatto? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I have been reading backwards and forwards what the story has said, and, um, I have been wondering if free mulatto um, apply to very, very fair, very light-skinned people, and if free color apply to darker people. I don't know Nancy, Dr. I call her Nancy, but Dr. Ferguson officially can say anything to that. Um, she's a, a, a doctor of history. Now, I call her Nancy because we go back to childhood. We lived on the same street. <laughs> There are some people who give that terminology, as you were saying, very clear, because they have ways and means of explaining, say, like, a hot troon is a well, a hot troon is like one egg, white, and, you know, that's like a little bit of um, cocoa in <laughs> yeah. and things like that. So um, it depends on the way 
But racism, racism is a very interesting, um, interesting thing to look at because I can rest assured that there are many people here and there are many people in Barbados who would not imagine that my grandfather was out there. I mean, I have been the subject of many descriptions in Barbados and um, I roll with it because I know who I am and I know how I grew up and I knew the environment I grew up in. I knew the respect that I was made to understand was necessary to humans as humans. Um, and I know I am very affiliated to what would be called the black community in Barbados because of how I was raised. Not because my parents had an agenda, just how I was raised. Um, more than, than what people would call in Barbados the white Barbadian society. But it doesn't mean that I can't um, understand and appreciate both sides of the coin. But um, race is an interesting thing because um, I have a 48% DNA result that is all Africa. And I have a grandfather held in there. And I have a great grandfather who I know how he was described. And I can imagine, I also have another side. I have the European white coming through. So, what can I say? I have a 1% Philippine, and I have um, a 51% European. Yes. Thanks very much for making your presentation. Not my intent. I can imagine. <laughs> but the question, uh, don't let us underestimate that the fact that a lot of the white plantation owners had children from the enslaved person. And those children were either called color or mulatto. They were not all white. Correct. Yeah. So that, that has to be thing. And if those children then go on and have children with other light skin. So many generations become yeah. white and white and they have children with white skin. That's correct. Right. 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 As a result of that, yeah. you get this yeah. color of a mulatto, which moved away from the white of a saddle. Yes, but now it's a mixture. And you're quite right, the, um, those persons were born in a slave society. So they would use slave labor. We, we now call it domestic servants. At that time, it was slave labor. One thing that what women have called domestic servant at that time during slavery would be slave labor. Right? They would have people who Correct. didn't have to pay uh, Correct. Correct. The very important. So the mixture of mulatto slave, and some people, like in, Al in Africa, they would call albinos. Correct. Basically the same thing. Now, I just want to just make one point, Mr. Larry, which I think will help you also and help others. On the enslaver registers between 1870 and 1834, in the listings of persons, they're, they're either black or colored. But what is interesting is that the headings, when you're an enslaver and you are not white, you are free mulatto more than, I, I haven't seen, I've seen FM, and not FN or FC. I see that on other documents. But what is interesting is that the term color is used for the enslaved persons. But, but if you're not black, if you're not described as black. And you also, um, what is interesting, there was a record I came across, and um, I brought that to the attention of, of Dr. Ferguson in her delivery last time. And that record stated that the person was colored and they were African born. So you have to also remember that on the coast of Africa, of West Africa, during this period, they would have been persons who were colored because of the European and the African. And a child being born or a person being raised in West Africa who then becomes enslaved and is grown up 
across the Atlantic, and they land here as an African color, and they're recorded on the registers as African color. So that's another dimension, another paper. <laughs> Quick question here. And then. Yeah. Growing up in Broadway, this is a uh, white Barbadian. Mm -hmm. I found that, and then living in England for a short while, I found that white people had difficulty in saying black. They referred to a black person as colored. Mm -hmm. That was my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very common experience in Barbados where I, I would say in recent times, I don't know how many of you are in my age group, but you know, we use the term black and white freely now. Yeah. But for a long time, yeah. even yeah. black persons didn't want to say I'm black. Yeah. They want to say I'm colored. Yeah. And one of the interesting things even in doing this research is speaking to I was speaking to a gentleman and um, you know he, he's an elderly gentleman, so speaking him with all respect as I wouldn't even if he was younger, but the point is that I understood where he was coming from. And I asked him a few questions, and he's very proudly telling me that his, you know, his his mother and his grandmother, his grandmother had relations with the overseer, and he's so proud of his name, and on and on and on. And he has no connect, no understanding of the dynamics that went on there. Um, you know, that he was brought a bag, small bag of sugar or something like that. So. Um, he sees himself, he lived in Britain for a while, he sees himself as colored. He doesn't see himself as a black person. He can't use that word. He finds difficulty in using that word. But this is not unique to Barbados. I mean, if you go to South Africa, um, if you go to South Africa, there are classifications. You know, they are black and they're colored. There's color, and that's existing today in South Africa by Africans who are considered black, and we would consider them black, all shades, but they definitely consider certain folks, black and certain folks under the head of color. I think we're good here all night. Martin, I think you'll have the last question. Right, Harriet? Harriet is the chief cook of our water here, not me. Well, that's almost a question, but just an observation. Uh, well, the use of the pre Here is that in the pre-emancipation records, when a person who's not white who is baptized, they usually identify the, the color of that person. Because recently I came across a baptism of uh, a free black woman in St. George, just around the, um, the, the apprenticeship uh, period. And you would also see some of the uh, earlier records reference to free colored woman, free black person, that so. But at the emancipation, you don't have that distinction, right? You, so you have to um, determine the race of the person by, yeah, the, by the information <laughs> that is given, you mm -hmm. know, the occupation, mm -hmm. the, the, because you get planter, and obviously the thing with the planter, you know, those. It's the occupations then which would lead you to think that yes, this person is, is black or this person is white. Whereas in the pre emancipation uh, period, it was clearly stipulated. When a non white person was baptized, they clearly identified that as a non white person. So those are the, some of the. Uh, you see a lot of interesting things in these. Um, documents, if you take the time to look. I am all for encouraging you not to do the box system with the land. I'm all for encouraging you to analyze each record. Look at the church, look at the abode, look at the occupation, look at the time period. Look at the time period against the history that's being written nowadays. And really understand what your ancestors went through. And here we are today. Um, I mean, it is a humbling experience. If I had known some of the history of my family um, growing up, if it had been orally just replayed, maybe um, it would have had a different um, impact on the life of my family and the life of 
you know. But I'm glad to be able to be doing it now, and I encourage you to, and all those viewing it to examine your family outside of the box system and document it. Harriet, I think I need to hand over to you. <laughs> Not you, really, 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 really. I'm handing to Linda, sorry. Sorry, that's okay. Hi, I've been, um, can you hear me? Yeah. I hate these things. Okay. Uh, I've been asked to wrap up here this evening um, by thanking everyone, but I, as I sit there and I listen to everybody, I thought I would share um, a little gem uh, within my family. Yes, to all intents and things, I'm white. I have like colored skin, but my family are definitely not the landed gentry. We were the, the poor whites on the, average, on the edges of Boscobel and St. John and whatever. And some years ago, um, I was talking with my grandmother and she mentioned that after emancipation and everything else with the influx of everybody, granted the apprentice system was still going on, um, but that there was an influx of people now for jobs. And in truth, what happened to a lot of the poor whites is they became absolute paupers because there were no longer jobs available for them. Many years passed and I met a lady a couple of years ago who lives, I think it is in Grenada or it might be St. Vincent, I'm not sure. And something came up about the poor whites in Barbados and red legs and she says, oh we have we have them in, in St. Vincent too. I, I'm saying it's St. Vincent, wherever it is. She says, we have them in St. Vincent too. And the person that was with me said, oh, what do you call them? She says, we call them Barbadians. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of the poor whites here left the island. Um, so I'm just sharing that little uh, gem with you. That's not what I'm here for. Um, I'm basically here just to thank everybody for coming. Harriet, um, who certainly goes over and beyond um, organizing these meetings and everything else she does for the genealogy group. Reminder, for those of you, I think this bus tour is going to be very interesting. I have a great uncle who married into colored, black, whatever color, and he owned part of where the University of the West Indies now is. So I want to go and find out a little bit of, about him there. So the bus tour, I think uh, with our new editor on connections, that's going to get even more and more interesting. And anyone who wants to share something, please do contact Nicholas for our next um, meeting. Of course, Marcia, over and beyond. Um, I came here expecting one thing and I got a whole set of other stuff plus what I was expecting. Um, thank you very much, Marcia. You're welcome. It really yeah. did. And Again, another, just a little sideline. Um, she talked about the journey to her ancestors. This whole family tree thing is a whole journey into family tree. It is a journey into history. It is a journey into social studies, and you become a detective. I, I, I swear we could become good detectives for the Barbados Police Force. Things that we pick up. I can oh. second that. <laughs> um, and just purely by accident. There were two ladies, and you probably saw them leave just now, who are Barbadians, left here. One of them left when she was 16 years old. And they went, their family went to Australia to better, them, better themselves. We, what, I, Harriet got in contact with me because one of them was re researching a family name that's in my family. And they decided to come to this meeting tonight. They had met Marcia at the archives. I walked in, I introduced them to a couple of people, and that lady, uh, Hilda Marshall, in the front with the hand in the air, she turns to the lady and she says, well, I only knew a Coral Mayers it was. Yeah. And she said, well, I'm Coral Mayers. They haven't seen each other in 50 plus years when they were at school together. <laughs> and they meet at a genealogy meeting here in Barbados. <laughs> anyway, that's again just an aside. So basically, um, it's just to thank everybody for coming. Uh, we have, where did refresh?
refreshments at the back. Right, we have a table with some refreshments. We have to thank Harriet from the museum and Nancy Jacobs and Marcia Nurse for their contributions this evening. Have a great evening. I'll see you all at the next meeting as we explore some more. And I agree, Barbados is sitting on a gold mine with um, family tree and ancestry and the powers that be need to do something about it. This year alone, the, I, I cannot more longer count. With the advent of DNA, people are pouring into this country to research their ancestors. And we need to do something about it to tap the potential that's here. Thank you.